It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Wednesday, October 5th, 2011. I am James Burns. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are joined now by Danny Panzella, fellow Ron Paul supporter, activist. His website is truesquad.tv. Danny, how are you doing? I'm very good, James. Always a pleasure to be with you. I caught you uh, Monday night on uh, Freedom Watch with uh, Judge Napolitano and Jack Hunter. Short segment, but uh, very, very informative. And that's one of the reasons why I'm having you on the uh, podcast. We've been talking a uh, great detail the past couple of days on Facebook, going back and forth. And I-, I wanted to get your take on what you've been seeing and witnessing firsthand down at Occupy Wall Street, because you've been down there talking to people, conversing. And w- what is the pulse? What What is the people? What is the makeup down there? Well, it's a wide uh, range of different uh, political and economic theories represented down at Occupy Wall Street. Uh, the media seems to be covering it, and they're, they're framing it strictly as a, a very leftist, anti-capitalist, um, communist almost um, protest, but it really isn't. Um, there's a lot of um, anarchists both left and uh, right-leaning free market capitalists as uh, communists, excuse me, anarchists. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different views being represented down there. And uh, what I've been watching happening and what's very upsetting to me, and which is why I've been trying to, to you know, spread the word as much as possible, is that the, the media, the mainstream media, is framing it strictly within that kind of left establishment um, uh, uh, framework because they want it to be, you know, typical left versus right, right? So they've got Mike Moore going down there. The CFR sends in their operative, and he goes down there to say, you know, we're anti-capitalism, we don't want any capitalism, abolish it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And then so now the right is going to respond to Mike Moore, because that's what they're seeing on TV. Oh, those are just a bunch of lazy communist kids who, who hate capitalism. They're following Mike Moore, and uh, that, that, that protest is, is worthless, and they, they don't have anything interesting to say, so I'm just going to ignore it. But what is actually happening down at Wall Street, and, you know, I want to encourage everybody to go down to, if, if there's an Occupy protest happening, because they're in cities all over the country now, in your area, go down and see what's happening, talk to the people. Um, Because what I found when I went down, and I went to cover it sort of as a journalist, um, was that there are free market people there who are sick of corporatism. Uh, There are Ron Paul supporters there. There are anarchists of of every flavor. So there are people that are not just, you know, communists who want things, you know, want free stuff from the government. That's what I've heard a lot of Tea Party people saying. Oh, those are just uh, people that want free stuff from the government. You know, I'd like to clear that up, uh, that misconception up as well, because from the people that I talk to, even the communists who I spoke to down there, uh, the communists are very willing to pay exorbitant amounts of taxes to make sure that the government has enough money to distribute to everybody, to make sure everybody uh, has free health care, free education, and all of these demands. So it's not that there are people who want free stuff from the government, that they're lazy, they don't want to work. Not at all. Uh, these, even the communists are, are people that want to work and are willing to give up their money so that everybody is, you know, uh, gets, you know, uh, equitable, what they see as, as equitable uh, distribution of resources. So, obviously, I'm a free market guy. I'm a Ron Paul supporter. I'm a, a libertarian or an anarcho-capitalist, a voluntarist. So, these are all kind of ideologies that I espouse and I subscribe to. So, I went down there, and I started talking to communists. And I started talking to anarcho-communists uh, and, and all the people on the left side and sharing my point of view and sharing how I thought that the, uh, well, what I know really, that the free market really is the most fair and equi- equitable way for uh, resources to be distributed because 
everybody has an equal chance and you are rewarded according to your efforts. So the people who are lazy and just want free stuff are not going to get free stuff. Uh, the people who cannot work or, or uh, the, the handicapped or, or children, uh, the elderly can be taken care of via free market charity, which, and, and you know, the, the common argument I get from the leftists is, well, people are selfish. They're not going to, they're not going to give to charity. I don't find that to be true, but even if, even if everybody is selfish, wouldn't we at least take care of our families? So if you have at least one capitalist in every or free market, you know, person in every family unit, then you've got at least one person who's going to work to take care of his immediate family. That should cover most people. And then the few orphans that there are, the, the small percentage of orphans uh, would be taken care of by, by charity. You know, I give 10% of my, my income to charity uh, per year. And I think a lot of people do that. So, I, you know, I, what I was really trying to do was spread the ideas of freedom, not just economic freedom, but, but a, of liberty in general, because it all, it all, all economic freedom really comes from, uh, you know, political and, and just the, the, the ideas of liberty that the founders and Ron Paul have understood. And really these ideas that have resonated in the hearts of men since the beginning of time, you know, these are the, these are the, principles that have inspired men to fight for their freedom uh, since you know, the beginning of time or since the beginning of, beginning of government. <laughs> as soon as somebody decided to try to oppress and enslave someone else, that spirit of liberty was there to inspire them to fight for that freedom. Well, Danny, there's most definitely been a cycle throughout history of tyranny versus liberty. I mean, it's been going on and on and on. And one thing that I do like about what you and other Ron Paulers and in the fetters are doing by going down there and actually talking to these people is you're, you're setting forth a conversation, a dialogue, instead of what everyone else is wanting to do, which usually is what happens with the two-party puppet show, this left-right false paradigm, is you have both sides demonizing each other, calling each other names, and all that other BS without even bothering to sit down and talk. And that's what I like about what you're doing and others are doing. You're actually going down there, talking to people, and that's what we need to be doing. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to go back for a minute to Michael Moore. Uh, Michael Moore was saying, uh, he was asked, uh, you know, is the Fed an important issue? And he said, no, the Fed's not an important issue. We just need to end capitalism. And that right there is your clue. Because Michael Moore, we all know, he's, he's a capitalist. He doesn't give away his, the profits from his films and books. As a matter of fact, after he gave a speech down at Occupy Wall Street, he went to a book signing at a bookstore in Lower Manhattan. So he's a guy that's, you know, he's profiting. He's not giving away all of his wealth. You know, at least... Um, uh, Roseanne Barr was also down there, and, and, you know, I don't agree with everything she says. She kind of is more of a leftist as well, but she's actually donating all the proceeds from her book to charities and to, and to different causes. So at least she has some consistency in, in what she believes, even though I disagree with her. But Michael Moore is a CFR member. You know, here, this guy is a total operative. He's a, he's a corporatist or a capitalist, whatever you want to call him, but he pretends to, to be against capitalism. And really what he's doing is setting up a straw man. He's down there to co-op that and put his face on it and brand it. And the unions are doing the same thing. We, we all know that, you know, what unions uh, were a good thing at one point, uh, but they're all corporations now, the unions. So you've got these groups trying to put their stamp, their brand on what's going on on Wall Street so that the other groups that disagree, the Tea Party and these other groups, will just reject it. So, you know, Mike Moore goes down there and says, you know, the Fed's not important. The Fed is the most important because the Fed is – Really, what I said on Judge Napolitano last night was it's the noose, it's the leash that the corporate, private corporate uh, oligarchs or elite have over our government. They use the Fed as their leash to silence our Congress people or really cut us off from our Congress. And basically, that's how they buy it. But, you know, he who has the gold makes the rules. So here they are printing money that they can buy off all these politicians, and then we get our voices disenfranchised. 
And this is the really right here, the, the, common, uh, the common issue that Occupy Wall Street has with the Tea Party. Both of them recognize that Congress was not uh, representing them. They're representing elite corporate interests. So the Fed really is that tether that if we cut that route, we, will, we can once again have a true representative, representative democracy where our voices are being heard, and, and it's not just which bank is giving the most money, so they're the ones who's, who are getting represented. So that disconnect that the Occupy Wall Street people really feel and they're very frustrated with, and they're blaming capitalism, uh, they're blaming the free market, uh, but they, what they don't realize is, and what I'm down there to tell them is, we don't have a free market. We have a centrally planned economy, and it's planned by the Federal Reserve Bank, whose shareholders are the top corporations that, that they're railing against. So they've got half the story right. And that's what the establishment wants. The establishment wants both sides to have half the story right and argue about the other half so that you never get the full picture. You don't connect all the dots because the moment the left and the right connect all the dots and join forces with each other, their game is over. It's finished. The Fed is done. So that is why they spend so much time, so much money, so much energy with the media to frame the debate the way they do so that we never connect the dots. And what I'm trying to do really, and I, I spoke to Dylan Radigan, I just posted an interview with him last night uh, about uniting the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street. We need to put down our egos on both sides and say, oh, forget the Tea Party, oh, forget Occupy Wall Street, they're, they're just a bunch of idiots, they're communists, so they're just they're kissing up to Wall Street on the Tea Party side. That's ego, you know, because we disagree with their solutions. I want to unite together, bring down the Federal Reserve System, restore our re republic, the democracy, and the republic that protects our, our God-given or natural rights, and then we can worry about it later. You know, then we can, we can worry about how to rebuild once we've gotten rid of the corruption. You know, that's the first step is to get rid of the Federal Reserve. So... You know, and my solution is, you know, and I think I'm more of a, uh, you know, a Jeffersonian uh, anarcho-capitalist, and I really feel that Jefferson was, a, was an anarchist at heart, and that, uh, you know, he, he just kind of pragmatically believed we, we do need a minimalist government, you know, minarchy, and that's what the, our republic is based on. Those are the same principles. So, you know, I, and, and you know what? If somebody wants to have a communist, uh, community within a republic, it's, it's possible. You can do that. Although you can't have a free market that exists within a communist, uh, central communist government. So, you know, if, if the way our republic is set up, if a state or a city wants to be more of a socialist or, or uh, you know, even communist city, you know, God bless them. If they want to vote that in, that's fine. As long as they're not forcing me and my state or my city to be communist as well. So. Well, definitely, That's I agree with you on all those points, and I, I watched the interview with Dylan Radigan that you did with him, and, I mean, a couple months ago, I mean, he really started waking up to all this stuff. Now, there's things that, obviously, I disagree with Dylan Radigan on, but at the same time, I do see common points throughout this threshold from all sides, people in the Tea Party, people in the Occupy Movement, from different spectrums, people are getting angry about some of the same issues they're they're waking up to the corruption of our government to both parties and the, they're they're seeing these the powers that be behind the curtains like for example the federal reserve as you mentioned and while at the same time at the beginning uh, the occupy movement didn't mention anything about the uh, federal reserve it, it seems like now more and more people are talking about it i've seen several videos with uh, occupiers marching and chanting in the fed and i've mm -hmm. seen several people speaking about in the fed down there as as well as yourself and i think that that is going to become a, a common theme as this progresses yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm not going to say that the overwhelming amount of people down there are not leftists. They are. They're definitely, they definitely dominate. And the way they're running, at least, at least in New York, I don't know what the other uh, uh, cities are doing, and I know that D.C. 
had kind of a fake Occupy Wall Street. Obama sent his uh, a bunch of his operatives down to kind of uh, set up a fake um, Occupy Wall Street, and, I, and Adam Kokish went down and did a video about it. Um, but in New York, they're running things democratically. And we watch, we watch them kind of make speeches and they have discussions and then they vote on to make decisions. Are we going to march? When or what time are we going to march? Uh, where do we want to march to? Uh, and, you know, it's real grassroots democracy. And they, you, it's evidenced by the fact that it takes them a while to get a consensus and <laughs> for it to really, to really work. But I appreciate that because it's real grassroots democracy. It's not this, you know, just kind of everybody jumps behind one person's vision and, and then we have a demagogue arise. So it's, it's the way democracy is supposed to work that everybody's kind of, everybody's equal and there's a lot of discussion and, uh, uh, they, they debate economic theory and political theory all day long. You can go down to, uh, Occupy Wall Street any time at any time. Even in the middle of the night, I went at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, after a Ron Paul event on last Monday, and people are debating economic theory. You can, you can walk into a conversation, and they're very welcoming. Come on in. You want to put in your two cents? And for the most part, people respect each other's opinions, uh, and, and it's really a dialogue. So that's why I'm saying... Come down if you're a Tea Partier. Come down if you're a, a conservative. Uh, come down if you're from the religious right. We're, we're, whatever party you're from or whatever ideology you're from, come down to Occupy Wall Street and make your point of view heard. You never know. You may convert some people. I've definitely seen the light go off in some people's eyes when I've discussed the Fed and how that's the leash around uh, the neck of uh, the Congress. And uh, when I've talked about force, and if you want a government that can that can redistribute wealth, it's got to take that wealth by force. So you know, there's a lot of anarcho-communists who I think have this little crisis of <laughs> this kind of oxymoronic uh, internal conflict where they want anarchy, but at the same time they want everybody, uh, the government, to give everybody everything. So it's kind of this weird thing. Uh, I, you know, I've tried to introduce them to the concepts of of voluntarism, but. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's uh, if if you come down, you can make your voice heard. You can speak in the general assembly. Anybody can, uh, and and then, you know, hopefully you'll you'll spread those ideas. And honestly, if enough Tea Partiers came down, they could probably shift the balance uh, towards towards you know more of a free market, uh, make it a free market protest. And uh, you know, I think that that would be really powerful. I think it would too, Danny. And I, I, I go back to uh, the uh, interview that Adam Kokish had with the uh, supposed Occupy DCers, and I don't think that they were Obama operatives. They might have been, but at the same time, I mean, look at you and me. I mean, we've talked about this before. Once upon a, once upon a time, you and I were both hardcore Bush supporters and stool pigeon Republicans. True. It took us time to wake up to all this. And, That's right. And I look at them the same way. I mean, right now, yeah, they might still be uh, rallying behind Obama blindly. But if you, if you engage them in conversation and talk to them about real issues instead of uh, belittling them and name-calling them, treat them as fellow human beings, you, you might just wake them up and make them say, hey, wait a minute, maybe it's both parties. Maybe it's not just W. Maybe it's Obama. Maybe it's everything. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, heard, I had heard some intelligence, not that I confirmed it, but I had heard intelligence that they were actually paid to do what they did. Um, that could not be true. But if they were just true Obama supporters who, who were genuinely still believed in, in hope and change, they, absolutely, I completely agree with you. Um, you know, I think that that's, that's the reason why um, Occupy Wall Street took this long to rise up rather than three years ago when the Tea Party did because they did believe in Obama that he was going to be um, – hope and change and that he was going to make things better. They, they really believe that he was going to fight back against the corporation. And now three years later, they see that Obama is the same. Uh, you know, it's just a, more of the same corporate controlled candidates. And, uh, you know, th that's another thing that the Tea Party said, oh, they're all Obama supporters. They're really not. There are very few people that still believe in Obama at Occupy Wall Street. And I, and I think that's going to be, you're going to see that across the country. And there's, like I mentioned, there's a collage of different points of view. You're going to have libertarians, Ron Paul supporters, and the fetters. You're also going to have anarchists, uh, liberals, 
communists, socialists, even some Obama supporters are going to be there as well. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad people. It's just that we need to engage in dialogue, focus on the things that we can all agree on, and move forward. And I know a couple months ago you had trouble having a flash mob in front of the New York Federal Reserve. Uh, is there any hope of you getting the uh, Occupy uh, Wall Street people to go and do an Occupy New York Federal Reserve? Yes, absolutely, and that's what we're working on. Um, before, I just want to make a point about one thing, uh, and then we can get to that. Um, the advice I want to give to people if they do come down to an Occupy protest is before you march in and start preaching Ron Paul or even preaching liberty, what you want to do is listen. Get your finger on the pulse of what's going on in that community. What you're, what you're going to find is that this kind of organic little community has sprung up. At Occupy Wall Street, there are people that, are, that have kind of appointed themselves janitors. They go around cleaning up after the other people, making sure the park is kept clean, respecting the property. Uh, there are people that are in charge of the food. They help distribute the food to everybody they, that is getting donated. Uh, there's people that are, uh, go out and collect cardboard. People are sleeping on cardboard mats, and there are people that go out into the city to find cardboard that's being used, you know, sent out to be recycled, and they're taking it to, to use for bedding. So there's this, like, community that has sprung up down there, and you'll find you, you want to go down there and listen to people and, and hear and, and see what they're feeling, feel the frustration that they're feeling, and that's going to give you the clue on how to reach those people because everybody's different. For some people, like I said before, the anarcho-communist, you can reach them by talking about force and how the government has to use force to be able to redistribute uh, resources. And that's something that will make sense to the anarchist part of them. Um, and you can talk about how the free market is fair and equitable. And that's just one example, but you want to you wanna figure out who that person is and how you can reach them, what topic uh, is going to be the topic that puts the light on in their eyes. So with that said, uh, we are working on um, Derek Bros, who is uh, from Free Thinkers in Houston, and I have been working together along with a bunch of other activists to start Occupy the Fed. Uh, the website is OccupyTheFed.net, and what we're doing is on November 22nd, which is generally in the Fed Day, we're rebranding it uh, Occupy the Fed, and we're looking to do in er at every Fed uh, a protest, you know, and Occupy, and we're hoping that we can get the Occupy Wall Street and the Occupy movements across the country to also join on board. But the idea is to really educate the people at not only at Occupy Wall Street, but whatever media coverage we get, whatever people are in the area, tourists, et cetera, you know, the same thing that I've been doing um, about the Federal Reserve and the scam that that system is. So we are, we are definitely trying to push it in that direction while the, the establishment is trying to co-opt it and push it into that kind of, you know, leftist box where they'll just neutralize them. We're trying to keep them on message, on point, that the Federal Reserve really is the, the seat of power that we need to overturn. So uh, the, that website, again, is OccupyTheFed.net. Uh, we're setting up Twitter accounts and YouTube accounts that you'll be able to keep track if you can't, if you're not close to a location and you just want to support or, and keep in contact, you know, we'll, we'll have those things up and running. But you can get all the information at OccupyTheFed.net, and that will link to all the different cities, which we'll, we have different activists in different cities kind of leading the charge. I'm heading up the New York City uh, protest. And um, so that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Well, that, that sounds very, very positive, Danny, and I, I agree with you entirely. The entire point of going down and talking to people is not just to, to, to talk and open your mouth, but you also got to, at the same time, listen to people. And, and I think that's part of the problem that we've had for too long now is that so many people go out and they talk about their point of view, and then when someone else is going to talk, they want to just you know, you know, shove cotton balls in their ear, and we can't do that anymore. We've got to have an actual dialogue. Yeah, yeah, it's really so important. And, you know, when you, when you see the community down at Occupy Wall Street, it's really a powerful thing. Uh, it's very touching to see all these people. And, you know, these, these people 
are sleeping out in the cold and the rain. You know, the temperature here in New York is, is between like 50 and 55 at night now. So that's cold to be sleeping outside, especially that it's been raining the past week. Uh, it's not very comfortable. And, uh, you know, these people are making personal sacrifices to be there in that park just to make a point. Because occupying that park the, is not really doing anything in and of itself. It's not like they're blocking Wall Street where they're, where they're impeding capitalism in any way. They're there for, it's a symbolic gesture. And that's one of the things I discussed with the judge last night was, you know, well, why aren't you in D.C.? Why isn't the protest in D.C.? Well, because... D.C. is not really the problem. D.C. is one of the symptoms of the problem because D.C. is bought and paid for. Wall Street is the symbol. Uh, is the Federal Reserve really, as a part of Wall Street, it, that's, the, that's the capstone, that's the eye at the top of the pyramid, right, is the Federal Reserve System, at least in the United States. So that's really, I think it's the most appropriate place for this to be happening, and uh, I'm just, I really, I, I really hope it's going to continue. Uh, the mayor is getting more and more impatient. The police are getting more and more aggressive. And they're really starting to, you know, I'm sure you heard that 700 people were arrested on Saturday. So they're really starting to uh, lose their patience. And my inside NYPD uh, uh, sources, I have a, a lieutenant who's a Ron Paul supporter, and he says that, when you see on these all these videos, it's it's the guys in the white shirts, it's the lieutenants and the above, the higher ranking uh, police officers. Then you know that those orders are coming from the top. So recently, it came out that go uh, was it Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan? Uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, it was J.P. Morgan that donated four and a half million dollars to uh, one of the NYPD. Uh, benevolent associations, or maybe it was directly to the department so they could buy equipment. So I have no doubt that someone at J.P. Morgan could make a phone call to Ray Kelly or to Mayor Bloomberg and say, listen, you know, you guys want to see those donations keep coming in so you can keep buying more equipment? Well, you guys got to shut this protest down. There's, you know, we don't like this. We don't want the Wall Street area uh, blocked. And, you know, the, the protesters themselves are not blocking the area. They kind of uh, have taken up residence in Zuccotti Park, which is in between Ground Zero and uh, Wall Street. But Wall Street has, they've, they've put police barricades all through Wall Street, so they've narrowed all the roads down where you can only walk single file. So you've got, a, you know, a, a single file one direction and single file the other direction. So it's inconvenient for people who are working on Wall Street, and it's annoying that they've got, because they're trying to keep it so that the massive amounts of protesters can't flood into to Wall Street and take up residence. So... Uh, you know, I can imagine one of these guys flies in in his helicopter and is annoyed by the fact that he's got to rub elbows with these common folk who are, uh, you know, in this narrow lane. And he calls Bloomberg and says, Bloomberg, shut it down. I just gave you $4.5 million. This, is, this has got to stop. So, I mean, you know, this is a little bit of conjecture on my part. But I'm, sure, I'm sure we can imagine something like that happening. And, uh, Unfortunately, you know, I mean, we've seen that happen, though, in the G20 protests and, what, nearly 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, actually, with the uh, WTO uh, protests up in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. And I have seen with my own eyes uh, what I feel, what I felt like, based on my evidence, and I highlighted in one of my first videos about the Occupy movement, um, there were definitely undercovers they addressed as anarchists. Uh, they had the the bulge on the ankle where the where the backup uh, weapon was, and they were these big, heavy built guys, and they were just kind of their posture was very uncomfortable. I could tell that they just really weren't uh, they weren't a part of the protest. These were not supporters. They were just kind of standing a few feet back and making their way through the crowd. And I have no doubt in my mind that these were undercovers. Uh, Luckily, and I was keeping my eye on them, they did not cause any or provocateur any violence, which I was glad to see. But, uh, you know, after the 700 people got arrested and as soon as they were released, they all went right back to Wall Street, you know, that they're going to start getting tougher and tougher. And on Staten Island, which is where I live, uh, a, a person called me. They, um, 
they work at a, at maintenance in a military base that's on the island. It's not an active military base, but uh, they said that the Army was there training NYPD in crowd control techniques. So I'm wondering when the riot gear is going to come out, when the LRAD weapons are going to come out, and you know when we're going to start to see some real heavy stuff going on. And I think something is going to have to be provocateur because these really are peaceful protesters. And that's their MO. You saw that happen in, uh, well, back in uh, WTO at uh, Seattle. It was confirmed that those were provocateur, you know, undercover cops. Uh, yeah. Back in Pittsburgh, not too long ago, G20. I mean, there were provocateurs there as well. So That's, that's something right. That I was arrested do. there. Yeah, you were, and several other, uh, you know, truthers and protesters that were out there, you know, basically journalists. And you think that they would leave the journalists alone, but no, they, did, they didn't want anyone out there recording anything, this, uh, this police state that we now live in. And That's it's right. just sad that you have you know, companies, big giant corporations, banksters like J.P. Morgan, donating millions of dollars uh, of money to um, the police department, NYPD, you know, basically with uh, strings attached, obviously, when at the same time, my opinion of uh, the police is they're supposed to uh, be paid for by tax dollars, i.e. the citizens. They're supposed to answer to us, not the right. banksters or corporate elite. Well, the good news about this is that the boys in blue, the lower-ranking officers, really are very sympathetic. Uh, you can see, even when they're making arrests, they really don't want to be doing it. They're, they're pretty uh, gentle. You know, they're not really abusive. Uh, as a matter of fact, last night, while I, right after I finished my Dylan Radigan interview, a, a cop approached me. Uh, one of the guys I was with had an in-the-fed shirt on. He just said, well, you know, said, listen, uh, uh, you know, I'm an in-the-fedder also. And, you know, they, they were, they're, they, a lot of times they can't express it. But once in a while, you'll get somebody to say, you know, give you a thumbs up. Or, you know, these, these guys, are their pensions are hurting. They know that the banks are coming for their pensions as well. They're fighting those battles with the union. So they know what's going on, and, you know, they're not stupid. So, but that's, that's why, uh, you know, the, the leadership, you, what you tend to see, and this is something that we all know, is that the, these are the guys that get promoted, the animals, that are willing to just follow orders, no questions asked, no conscience. Uh, these are the guys that end up in those types of positions, and those are the ones they send in when they want to show, uh, you know, when they want to exercise their authority or kind of, you know, uh, bully a little bit just to remind the protesters, look, we're still in charge. We're letting you get away with this protest, but, you know, every once in a while they have to flex their muscle. To and, control. And from what from what you've been telling me, I and mean, it sounds very, very likely that they're eventually going to really flex their muscles, especially if that army training that's going on is true. I mean, it's only a matter of time before this gets really ugly. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. And uh, you know, I've we've been trying to say, and that's one of the reasons why the pro protesters are saying, especially respectful. You know, on the bridge the other day, it was it was really a very obvious. And I didn't get on the bridge. You know, I have a seven month old now. <laughs> I had no, I had no child at the G20. So, and I'm not saying that I'm afraid of arrest. I'm willing to be arrested for the cause, but that made me think twice because my son was at home. So when I was marching with, you know, everybody, I was with Luke Radowski and we marched up and Luke was like, all right, I'm going to go on the bridge. And I said, no, man, I'm going to hang back. I just, I saw the police, um, splitting the, the protesters into two groups. One of them was going up on the pedestrian walkway. The other, they were allowing to walk on the street. I said, something doesn't feel right. This is like divide and conquer is happening here. I, so I stayed back. I stayed at the foot of the bridge. And 10 minutes later, they stopped the line. Now, now mind you, there's a line of police walking in front of the crowd, the protesters, and a line in the back. And alongside, there were also cops marching. So basically, they're caught between a, a wall of police on three sides and the bridge, the, the barriers of the bridge on the other side. So unless they were going to jump into the water, there was no place to go. Yeah, they were being herded to the, up to Brooklyn Bridge intentionally by the NYPD. Exactly. As a matter of fact, and I, I have not been able to find the report, um, but... At that time, I was following the tweets. That's how I knew what was going on on the bridge. I mean, I could see somewhat, but, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, pretty far away at that point, you know, a few hundred yards. Um, and I was following the tweets from the official Occupy account, 
And uh, at some point, there was an article that where an NYPD officer or uh, one of the one of the administrators made a comment to that effect that this was a planned a planned operation against the protesters, almost like saying, you know, we we were intentionally trying to shut it down. But the reports were that they were actually moving cars. They were directing, they had moved all the traffic over to one lane so that the protesters had two lanes to march in. So here they are direct, redirecting traffic. Then all of a sudden they stop the protesters in the middle of the bridge where now they're cut off. They can't escape the bridge and they start arresting people. No, well, I, I should, I jumped the gun. One of the white shirts got into a conflict with one of the protesters. It turned into a beating and an arrest. So now imagine you've got a few thousand protesters locked on this bridge by walls of cops, and now the cops start beating on a protester. How upset these guys are going to get and how agitated and nervous they're starting to get. So, you know, people are going to start to do stupid things, and I think that's the, the very thing that the NYPD was hoping for. We'll make an example out of one. We'll get this crowd. This is all psychological warfare. We've got the Rand Corporation, a military contractor, writing NYPD policy. I've written about this on TruthSquad.tv if you want to check out the articles. The Rand Corporation has been consulting with the NYPD for the last five or six years, writing their policy. So you've got this, these psychological warfare tactics being used against these protesters, the very same tactics that are being used in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. So, you know, I... It, well, it's, it's not just Afghanistan or Iraq, Danny. Look what happened, what, a month or so ago in England with the uh, protests there. They started out peacefully. Then the Met beat up this 16-year-old girl, and that's what sparked the riots. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what we see here is is um, the same thing, the same playbook by these guys. That's right. That's right. And it's the same playbook they used in Pittsburgh and, you know, going back and probably the WTO. It's the same MO every time. And that's that's why it's predictable. That's why I didn't get on the bridge. But, um, you know, they let some of the people go. Luke was able to get out without getting arrested. He was up on the on the second tier. They didn't arrest anybody up there. They were just arresting people on the roadway. So... Yeah, and then the NYPD came out today with this video, you know, that they shot showing one of the white shirts, you know, with a megaphone talking about, well, if you don't get off the bridge, you're going to be arrested. You can barely hear the guy. He's not even exactly, he's not yelling like Alex Jones does. He's barely <laughs> talking with this megaphone. Meanwhile, you have thousands of protesters, obviously, you know, you know, bleeding him out. So you really can't hear him. Like, well, that's not exactly going to help the people get off the bridge. Well, that's, like, oh, that's propaganda anyway, because they were cut off in the back. They were blocked. They couldn't yeah, get off. Propaganda. They couldn't go anywhere. No, of course not. Of course, they wanted to make themselves look good by throwing out that, that garbage propaganda piece. Oh, well, yeah. we tried to get them off the bridge. We warned them. <laughs> well, what's unfortunate is that, you know, most people, the, the Tea Party and and most conservatives or even neoliberals are going to look at it and say, yeah, these are just a bunch of commies and, uh, you know, whatever. They, they're not obeying the cops and they deserve it. That's, that's all I see is, is people like on Facebook, uh, oh, they, they deserved it. They broke the law. They deserved... No, they, they were led by the police. They had an escort <laughs> the whole way. The police don't let them go anywhere without an escort. So... Yeah. And they're, they're so concerned about this law that the Occupy movement supposedly broke. Well, what about the, the laws that our government leaders have broken? What about the laws that the banksters and the corporate elite have broken? What, what about those laws? Well, he who has the gold makes the rules. So if you're rich, you can break laws. If you're a hippie who sleeps in a park, you're not allowed to break laws. That's it. No, or or even if you're, a, a nice if you're little... a middle class, you can't break the law. <laughs> That's a nice little double standard, isn't it? Yeah. But, I mean, I, I just hope that, like like you mentioned a moment ago, that not all the NYPD are in on this, especially the blue shirts. They're, a lot of them, you know, they're, they're at stake, too. Most police officers are in the same hole that we're all in. I hope that they eventually wake up and realize that. But at the same time, we, we need to get out there, and we need to educate more people. And that's what I like about what you're doing and others are doing, going down there in the trenches, talking to these people that, you know, at first may have been not exactly – on the same side we are but in the truth I, I see us on the same side we have just different points of view just like we have for so long now that's, that's what right. I see this this country about Danny is we're, we're supposed to be a melting pot we're supposed to have different points of view different philosophies that's what's supposed to make us great that's right 
That's absolutely right. It's us against the one percent, and that's you know one of the themes of Occupy Wall Street is that we are the ninety nine percent. Well, the Tea Party is the ninety nine percent, and Occupy Wall Street is the is the ninety nine percent, and all the people who are still at home on TV and not involved in either one are part of the ninety nine percent. We are all part of the ninety nine percent, unless you're, you know, the head of a conglomerate. You're ninety nine percent, and you know. The, the system is designed in a way that we, op- we have to oppress each other. We have to be against each other to, just to be able to feed our families. And that's how, that's how they get us. It's divide and conquer. So, you know, you've got these blue shirts who are reluctantly following orders, but they're still following orders because they have to, or else they could be suspended. And, you know, they've got families to feed just like the rest of us. So, there's that decision, well, should I arrest this protester or, you know, and be able to feed my family or do I stand on principle and not, you know, and unfortunately your family win every time. So that's how they get us by designing the system in that way. Yeah, and that's the sad reality. And I think it's going to get to the point in this country in the very near future. I think it's coming sooner rather than later where uh, a lot of people in uniform, not just police, but men and women that serve in the military are going to have to make that decision. They're going to have to decide when things get so bad, what side are they on? Are they on the side of the people and the Constitution? Or are they on the side of this tyrannical regime? And hopefully most of them will make the right decision. And you're absolutely right. We are, most of us, unless you're worth hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, most of us make up the 99%. It doesn't matter if you're worth uh, five, six, or even seven figures. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think that we don't have much to worry about. I think that when the time comes, you know, I don't think an officer, most officers are going to fire or military are going to fire on the American people in in a case like this. You know, arresting a protester who's going to get a ticket and then be released, you know, is one thing. Being asked or being ordered to fire on those protesters is something completely different. And I, I think that as obvious as evidenced by the fact that Ron Paul gets more military donations than any other candidate, including Barack Obama and all the GOP combined, uh, it's pretty obvious where the military stands on these issues. No, I agree entirely, and I think the moment that they do resort to violence and lethal force, the moment they they start gunning down uh, peaceful protesters, I think that's when you're going to see a lot of Americans out there that are gun owners are going to say, well, that's it. You know, The gloves are going to come off, and hopefully we won't get to that point. Uh, Danny, uh, how can people find out about everything that you're involved with and doing? Well, you can follow me on TruthSquad.tv. Uh, I've got links to my YouTube channel. You can watch all the videos coming out of um, Occupy Wall Street um, and uh, 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 OccupyTheFed.net if you want to get involved with that. It's a, it, the website has just, we just put it up yesterday. It's under construction, um, but we will be adding information and, and, uh, and expanding that site as, uh, as it's available. So if you're in an area that has a Fed and you want to organize a protest, or if you're not, if there is, is no Fed, you can still do a protest. Um, pick pick a, a place in the, in your city that's appropriate. You know, maybe the financial center, Borough Hall, uh, or City Hall. You know, something something that's appropriate and have a, a solidarity uh, rally or march in that in that place. It doesn't have to be out of Fed. If you can get to a Fed, great. And if you want to be the point man to start or woman to start the the initiative in your city, uh, email us. There's a, an email link. Uh, on uh, on OccupyTheFed.net, and uh, you know we'll help you get started. And I'm going to be making those uh, Bernanke dollars, which is what I hand out. Those are available. Um, also, if you want to make a donation, I would really appreciate that. Where um, if you go to the Economic Crisis was an inside job dot com, you can make a donation to help me purchase Bernanke dollars. Every dollar that is donated goes directly to the printer to print these up. I'm the goal is for me to get 10,000 of them so that I can hand them out, uh, leading up to at Occupy Wall Street, uh, leading up to November 22nd and give the rest out there in the city and, and even beyond, you know, I'd like to make as many of these things as possible. If you haven't seen the Bernanke dollars, you can, you can actually download them and print them yourself, or you can uh, order the high quality glossy ones from us. Uh, either way, you know, you're free to use them. I hope that you will. 
uh, and hand them out in your own area, educate people on the private Ponzi scheme that is the Fed. And that's about it. I just, uh, I just hope that everybody, everybody can do something. You know, Jordan Page has an awesome song that just really, it really brings me to tears every time I hear it. And the theme of the song is, what can one man do alone? And that's really, that's the theme I, song I used in the, the, that, in the Fed video with my son. And we can do a lot by ourselves. You don't have to be part of an Occupy Wall Street or, or even an End the Fed rally to accomplish something, although it helps. It helps to make a, to make a, a media presence, you know, when we have 500 or 1,000 or, or a million people show up to something like that. It's always great. But every day in your own life, you can be making a difference by just talking to the people around you at work and just explaining and, and not, you know, in an obnoxious way or getting into arguments and yelling at people, you know, um, just dropping seeds and, and talking to people in your own lives and waking people up. You know, somebody woke me up, you know, I, uh, I was going through some stuff in my life and, uh, when George Bush said we have to suspend the free market to save it, it didn't make sense to me. And then somebody at that moment handed me a documentary and it was just fate. <laughs> and here I am now. And so now I have a little bit more of an audience and which is great, but you know, people are, my, my friend that woke me up is not somebody that comes out to protest. He just, in his own life, he just hands out documentaries to the people that he knows and talks to and cares about. And he wakes people up. And if it wasn't for him waking me up, you know, there's a lot of people that I've woken up that maybe wouldn't have gotten woken up. So you have to look at that ripple effect or that butterfly effect and just know that one man can make a huge difference. Well, I, I agree entirely, Danny. I mean, that's that's how you and I woke up. We had other people talking to us, telling us, you know, the truth, even though at first it probably would have been difficult for us to listen because, you know, it's the programming. But that's what it takes. You know, the smallest pebble, pebbles, you know, make the largest ripples, and everybody can do their part to make a difference. And I think you're doing a, a great deal with everything you've been doing with TrueSquad.tv and, you know, confronting people and going down there to these Occupy uh, – groups and talking to them and and I, I applaud you for what you're doing and what everyone else is doing I think what we're what we're trying what we're seeing here Danny is a moment in history that can go one or two ways either it's going to go the way towards liberty and freedom and we're all going to work together and find some common ground or if we if we don't seize this opportunity I fear that it could go the other way where we're at each other's throats and that's something that's nothing new unfortunately that's right yeah uh, uh... That's why community is so important. Staying close to the people around you. If you don't know your neighbors, introduce yourself to them. Not just for the, for the reason of waking them up. I mean, you want to wake them up, but we need to have community around us so that we can protect each other, we can have each other's backs. And, uh, you know, community is the way we beat this because that's what they're trying to do is break up the communities and divide and conquer. And uh, as long as we stick together... You know what? I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said it. If we if we don't hang together, we're going to hang separately. Exactly. So. Danny, thank you so much for joining me. I will talk to you soon. All right. Take care, James. There he goes, Danny Penzella. His website's once again TrueSquad.tv, OccupyTheFed.net, and of course, the Economic Crisis was an inside job.com. Once again. The Economic Crisis Was an Inside Job.com. And uh, our website, freedomfiles.us, so we got a new poll question for you. What do you think about the Occupy movement? Log on to freedomfiles.us and cast your vote. And while you're at freedomfiles.us, you can join us on several social sites. We're linked up at Facebook, rtr.org, youtube.com. we got a YouTube channel, Freedom Files US, so feel free and friend and subscribe to us. And coming up tomorrow on the Freedom Files podcast, we'll be joined, as always, every Thursday. Thursday by Bob Chapman. The international forecaster.com is his website. And if you have any questions for Bob, feel free and send them my way via the freedomfiles.us website. And I will talk to you tomorrow with Bob Chapman right here on the Freedom Files podcast.